contains the complaint warrant, the affidavit of probable cause, and the preliminary law enforcement incident report. Uh, everyone has that? Yes, sir. I do. Yes, Judge. Usually the prosecutor marks that as S1, so I'm going to mark that as S1 and move that into evidence unless there's an objection. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. I'm sorry, Mr. Thompson, what you said? No objection. Thank you. Uh, I also have the public safety assessment in my file. The public safety assessment was run on March 27, 2020 at 841 in the morning. Uh, it has a failure of peer score of three, a new criminal activity score of three, a elevated risk of violence flag, and a no release recommended. Uh, the prosecutor usually marks this as S2. Any objection to marking this as S2 and moving into evidence? Ms. Mays or Mr. Thompson? No, Your Honor. No objection, Your Honor. Okay, so that's S2. And lastly, I have a notice of motion for pretrial detention and a supporting certification authored by Jennifer Hans, who's an assistant prosecutor at the KB County Prosecutor's Office. Uh, this is usually marked as S3 and moved into, I'm going to move that as S3 into evidence. Any objection, Ms. Mazur or Mr. Thompson? No yeah. objection, Your Honor. Before we get started, <clears throat> before we get started, is there anything else that either the state or the defense wants to mark and, and have the court consider? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Okay. So with that, we're going to now, uh, now that the record is, what's being moved into evidence is, is has been placed on the record and is clear. We're going to move to the probable cause determination. And with regard to the issue of probable cause, uh, is are we going to be proceeding by way of uh, witnesses? I don't see any witnesses. I'm assuming it's either going to be proper or stipulation. Uh, I'll turn to you, Ms. Mays, or how are we proceeding? Um, we would do it by, by proffer unless there is a stipulation. So I'd leave that to Mr. Thompson. No, Judge, I, I would object and challenge a probable cause finding as to second degree aggravated assault. Okay. Uh, without so, even challenging the proffer, uh, I think on its face, Judge, it doesn't meet the definition in that so, there's no allegation of significant serious bodily injury. Okay. So, Ms. Mazur, I'm going to hear from you regarding uh, probable cause. Yes, Your Honor. By way of proffer. So, go ahead, please. Yes, Your Honor. Um, on, I'm just going to check my dates here. On February 28th, uh, 2020 in Lower Township, um, the victim, the victim actually went to the hospital. Um, one second. What was the date? February 28th. Okay. Um, went to the hospital um, and police were involved because it was potential for a strangulation. Um, I will note that at that time, the victim said that it wasn't um, at the hands of this defendant, that it was from an unrelated um, incident with him um, that was not due to a domestic violence strangulation. Um, however, there were concerns, which was why the police were involved, that the marks did appear to be from a strangulation, um, and uh, therefore the police were called. Um, nothing was done at that time. It wasn't until um, on March 4th that um, that police officers became involved in an unrelated issue involving this case, realized there was an active TRO that had not yet been served on the defendant, um, and noticed in the TRO that the victim was placed under oath and actually stated, which I believe Mr. Thompson should have in his possession, the, the TRO, um, that during a verbal argument, um, the defendant became physical um, and grabbed her by the neck. Um, she had difficulty breathing, um, continued yelling, um, preventing her from going to sleep. And this happened for a couple of hours, um, this, this strangulation of the victim. She also said that, one second, Your Honor. You're not proffering that she was strangled for a couple of hours. You're proffering that there was a back and forth, and during that back and forth, she was strangled during that two hour span period. Yes. yes, but she did say she had difficulty breathing. He grabbed her by the neck, um, and that this 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 was ongoing. She's not specific, but this was ongoing for two hours. So, as to the strangulation, I'm, I'm not saying that maybe the strangulation went on for two hours, but this verbal physical abuse went on for two hours. Um, during that time, and that he's become more abusive to her, 
And sorry, I should make sure I'm reading this correctly. His, his abuse has become escalating. Um, as to the strangulation, I think that's very clear. As to the ag assault attempt or cause um, injury, I just want to make sure they put it right in here. Uh, attempt to cause serious bodily injury. I think that um, number one, the standards obviously very low um, for the state, but um, putting your hands around a victim's neck, causing her not to be able to breathe, um, having her to go to the hospital to seek treatment um, certainly is an attempt to cause serious bodily injury um, in this case. Um, she had difficulty breathing. She had visible signs of injury to the point that medical professionals contacted the police because they thought it was a strangulation, even though she didn't. So there were such visible signs of a strangulation that the police were actually called, um, and that's how they got involved in this case. And then she went under oath and, and said what happened. Um, so I believe that uh, goes to the probable cause as the attempt uh, to cause uh, serious bodily injury. Thank you, Ms. Mazur. Mr. Thompson? Thank you, Judge. As I said, I'm not challenging necessarily the proper facts, but I'll focus just on these the allegations of second degree um, aggravated assault, Judge, based on an allegation of an uh, attempt to cause serious bodily injury. And I'll refer to... Uh, 2C11-1, which defines have, serious bodily injury. I have, I have that open, Mr. Thompson. And I, your yes, argument, your, your, the argument is, uh, I understand. I'll, I'll let you make the argument, but I do have it open. I yep. do have 2C11-1B, which has the definition of serious bodily injury. Ex exactly, Your Honor. That's exactly right, Judge. So in order to fit within the definition or, or to uh, reach the definition of serious bodily injury, there would have to be bodily injury, which creates a substantial risk of death. And while grabbing someone around the neck or even choking them might in some way or another create a bodily injury or even some risk of death, the police were there, they saw the lady, and they were of the opinion that, they, that there was a, a substantial risk of death because my reading of the uh, proffered information judge, the police report and the probable cause affidavit is the police responded to their residence. Right. They saw the lady and they talked to the lady. And my understanding is that she denied that Mr. Um, Rivers had Mr. caused Tops, that injury uh, to her. Mr. Tops, I'm not, I don't mean to cut you off. I'm, I'm just trying to yes, be efficient sir. because it's, it's a little bit strange with this virtual courtroom. But I, I think that what you're arguing in you, the nature of the offense and the weight of the evidence are factors that go to detention. And you may have a good argument on that on, with regard to those factors, because from the materials that are already submitted, submitted into evidence, S1 for S3, in particular S1, uh, it, clear, it appears that the, the complainant uh, stated that the injuries were caused in another way, uh, a consensual way. I read that uh, when she first uh, reported it. Uh, and there's some other things that you can argue there, but as to the issue of probable cause, whether there's enough for the issuance of the complaint for second and third degree aggravated assault, let's focus on that. I heard your argument that you don't believe it's a substantial risk of death. If that's your argument as to probable cause, why don't we, why don't we move on to the next after I make a finding as to probable cause, we can move on to the detention issue. Because I think your arguments go more toward the detention issue than the probable cause. Issue. Understood. Understood, Judge. Uh, and, and that essentially is my argument. I think the court understands, Judge. So you say move on to detention at this nope, point? Nope, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually I'm gonna interject unless you have anything further. Uh, Ms. Mays, I'm going to... Just, just one, one yeah. thing, Judge. What do you have marked as S3? I have the uh, notice of motion and certification from the prosecutor. Okay, Judge. I will object to the prosecutor's effort or, or using uh, the TRO, information contained in the TRO. It was not... It's, I understood it wasn't uh, offered as evidence that she would be using during this hearing. And generally speaking, Judge, the information from a, a domestic violence matter is generally not admissible in a criminal matter except under certain circumstances, and I don't believe this would be one. So I would object to the states uh, proffering any information from the TRO. Okay, I'm, I'm going to overrule the objection. There. Over, I'm overruling the objection because the state is moving by proffer. And when they're moved by proffer, they're not limited 
to the, the actual items in evidence. They can move, rely on a police report. They can rely on uh, other things that they're proper for the restraining order. As for the restraining order not being admissible in the proceeding, I believe, and I could look up the rule if you want me to, I believe that there are No, Judge, I understand. It indicates understand that the sure. testimony can't be used in, um, unless certain circumstances. But it doesn't say that understand. the other... Uh, the the order itself can't be used at, for example, detention hearing. So I'm going to make an objection, but that's again not necessarily uh, a probable cause, but it would be relevant as the detention. And we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, the court's going to going to address the issue of probable cause. Regarding that issue, our Supreme Court has described probable cause as a well-grounded suspicion that a crime has been committed and a well-grounded suspicion that the defendant is the one that committed it. And I'm citing Gerstein versus Pew, 420 U.S. 102, 1974. Uh, in this, with respect to this case, uh, having heard the proffer of the state, having reviewed the complaint warrant, the affidavit of the probable cause, the preliminary law enforcement uh, report, uh, and all of the materials uh, that are before the court, uh, the court's going to find that there is probable cause here. There is probable cause that on... Uh, specifically on February 28, 2020, in Lower Township in the county of Cape May, uh, that the defendant committed aggravated assault by attempting to cause death or serious bodily injury to Allison, to AR, specifically by placing his hands around the neck of AR, causing her to have difficulty breathing in violation of New Jersey Statutes 2C12-1B1, a second-degree crime. The reason probable cause is a very low standard with regard to that crime. Certainly, if you cut off someone's airway for a significant period of time, where they have marks around their neck, uh, that could cause, create a substantial risk of death. I mean, people are strangled to death. Uh, as you know, having been a criminal lawyer for a long time, people are strangled to death uh, in cases every year. Uh, and it's a low standard. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't have to rule on whether they can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. It's just a, it's a low standard of probable cause. They've met that standard uh, at this proceeding. Uh, in addition, the court finds probable cause at, that on February 28, 2020, in Lower Township, the county of Cape May, the defendant committed aggravated assault by attempting to strangle AR, specifically by placing his hands around the neck of AR, causing her to have difficulty breathing, that in violation of New Jersey Statute 2C12-1B13, that being a crime in the third degree. Uh, those are the two charges that are on the complaint warrant. Probable cause has been found. At this point, we're going to move on to the issue of detention. I'm going to note, again, that the preliminary, uh, or rather the public safety assessment has a 3-3 elevated risk of violence, no release recommended uh, determination. Uh, however, the state has the burden by clearing, by showing, by clearing convincing evidence that no conditions would satisfy the requirements of the statute and or rule. Uh, the release, however, is presumed in this case. So with those parameters, I'm going to hear again from Ms. Mazur. Your Honor, it's the state's position that there's no amount of uh, monetary bail um, or conditions or combination thereof that would ensure um, the safety of the victim, defendant's appearance in court, um, or that he would not obstruct the criminal process. Um, starting with obstruction, as you can see, the um, complaint was signed on March 4th. However, this defendant um, was at large until, um, until he was picked up on March 26th. Um, thereby, um, these, these complaints were filed, a warrant was issued, um, they were actively looking for him. Um, he was, uh, to, to the courts, to the state's knowledge at some point in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, so as to obstruction, I think that goes to obstruction of the criminal process and to potential for flight. He's now facing second degree near charges, um, on the second degree aggravated assault, um, that again goes to his desire to flee. He's already done it before. He was at large for almost a month in this case. Um, and now uh, that he's facing these charges and he's been arrested, um, it only gives him more incentive to leave. And it, apparently he has ties not only to Pennsylvania, but it appears he has um, a criminal history that puts him in many other states as well. Um, I believe that goes to obstruction and flight. As to the safety- There's no of criminal the history, Ms. Mazur, in his PSA. I know. So, so I'm just like, you know, and I know. I, and I am going to, to discuss that. Um, he does have out of state history that does, didn't make it into the PSA, um, which I believe Mr. Thompson should be aware of. And, uh, and the defendant himself, it shouldn't be news to him that he has, um, that he has a conviction from another state. Conviction um, for what? 
The state has an aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Where, when was that? Where was that? I have that it's from. I mean, that's certainly information that the court would need to know. I'm not sure why that's not for the court. I know your client is raising his hand, but I'm not. Mr. Uh, Thompson, we're going to hear from you in a moment. No. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't have that. It's conviction date of 2-19-2013. I have a confinement date of five years. And it's out of, I believe, Florida, but uh, Texas. I also have a juvenile record on him. Okay, well, we're going to, so I'll, I understand that. I'll hear the rest of your argument. Okay. That's it. So basically, you have an aggravated assault from 2013 where you think that you received five years. Yes, Your Honor, and I have a, a juvenile record as well for him out of Florida. Okay. Um, he also has... Not uh, a or probation at this time, right? No, but he does have pending charges. Um, he has um, an offense date of 11-11-2019 for possession of marijuana. He also has 12-14-2019 um, possession of marijuana. Um, that's a prior DP conviction. And then he has pending charges at the time that he um, committed these new offenses. So that's... Marijuana charges. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Just northern persons um, yeah. out, of, out of this county. Um, so that's concerning to the state as well. Um, most concerning is the severity of this offense. Um, it is an aggravated assault. I know, um, you know, it's been argued that the, the victim herself um, didn't, you know, first come forward, um, but she did come forward. And her reasons for that and for not coming forward right away shouldn't be speculated to. Um, she could have been scared of this defendant. He tried to kill her, essentially, as the state's position. Um, by strangling her. So, you know, it's certainly um, within the realm of possibility that she was scared to come forward or to, to say anything, especially if he was going to be released. Um, she did have visible signs of injury. It is second degree. Um, she did say in that TRO that his, his uh, actions have escalated. Um, so we would ask that he be held um, in light of the charges that are now pending. He has pending charges. And the fact that he's been at large for a month um, and, and has ties to other to you other say at large, do you, I mean, do you have information that he was he had noticed and then he fled, or are you are you just saying he wasn't apprehended for a month? Well, he was the the warrant issued, um, and it appears that the police received information that he was in Pennsylvania, um, that he left for Pennsylvania, and they weren't able to get him there. I understand, but I mean, there's a difference. You would agree with me. There's a difference between someone who knows there's a pending charge and flees and someone who just happens to have ties to another place like Pennsylvania is in Pennsylvania, right? Yes, Your Honor. I do and, agree with that. I and just, you're, all, you're saying your argument is essentially, I know you're saying he's at large, but your argument is that he was in Pennsylvania for some time and he was eventually apprehended. But you're not you're not arguing to the court that he had noticed and he fled, correct? I just want to double check because I, I do believe he did have noticed, but I just want to double check before I say that. Connor, I may be able to save some time on that issue. I want to make sure Ms. Mazur's done and then because sure. uh, I don't know if it was yesterday or last week. We had it, I think it was last week with Mr. Anglada. We had a day where we went back and forth and back and forth and we're going to try to have a little yes. control, even though I'd like to give the attorneys the opportunity to argue everything they want to argue. And Mr. Thompson, when you do uh, argue, I want to hear because I want to hear about the aggravated assault. That's, in fact, what, what the situation is with that, that case. So when, when it's your turn, please address that. Yes, sir. I don't have any information as to whether it just said that uh, they believed he had gone to, to Philadelphia um, and that that's why they hadn't been able to serve the restraining order either. Okay. Um, but he would have been noticed about the restraining order and they would have tried to make contact. Um, but... Yeah, I will note that these charges weren't authorized until March, even though it happened in February. And just as to the ag assault, and I, I do know we established probable cause, but as Your Honor said, you know, somebody when they're being choked could be, you know, dead in seconds um, if they're if they're not able to breathe. So I just want to make sure that was flushed out. Okay, thank you, Ms. Mazur. Mr. Tom. Thank you, Your Honor. First, uh, I'll start by saying Mr. Um, Rivers was apprehended in the lobby of the Lower Township Police Department when he turned himself in on the 26th. Uh, 
after he learned there were charges for him, there may be charges for him, he consulted counsel. And, Your Honor, I'm satisfied that he is prepared to uh, follow the advice of counsel, which is why he turned himself in. Uh, the aggravated assault, as I understand, Judge, came about as a result of a dispute um, that Mr. Rivers had with the alleged victim here. They have a child in common, and she has a serious substance abuse problem. And Mr. Uh, Rivers, I understand, got upset when he learned that she had passed out after using substance while she was caring for the child. Uh, Mr. She, as I understand, Judge, doesn't reside in New Jersey anymore. Mr. Rivers doesn't know where she resides, but there is now a temporary restraining order, and I represent him on that, Judge, and he is he understands what is involved, and he doesn't intend to have any contact with her whatsoever. He understands that the court will make provisions for him to have visitation with his uh, son. Now, the aggravated assault judge, it's my understanding, the police came to his um, house uh, where he was living with, uh, with the alleged victim after there had been an argument. The police questioned her out of the presence of Mr. Rivers, and she denied that he had done anything to her with purpose to cause her harm. And the court has read the papers, and I won't uh, belabor it. Honestly. She said that the, but, um, uh, she said that the uh, contact with Mr. Rivers was consensual in nature. That's Sorry. correct, Judge. That, that, that is correct. Okay. And, uh, Judge, I, I think that goes to uh, the strength of the state's case, and I'll, I'll let it go at that, Your Honor. Um, but Mr. Rivers is 28 years old. He, If he is released, Judge, he would be residing with a friend at 17 Cheshire Drive in Galloway Township. Um, and as I said, he did turn himself in. He was working at Bud's Bait and Tackle Shop, Your Honor, when he was, uh, when he was charged. I don't know what the status is right now because of the right. pandemic, I understand. but uh, he, he did he did have a job. And Judge, I will say this, um, Ms. Mazur indicated that I she thought I was aware of any criminal history. I was completely unaware of any criminal history and didn't hear any of it until uh, she provided that. And Judge, respectfully, I know things are a little hectic here, but I should have been provided that. Be that as it may, Judge, I believe there are a combination of conditions which have put in place would assure two things that Mr. Rivers will show up when he's supposed to. After all, he turned himself in. He did get counsel, not so he could run, but so he could address the issue. And the uh, violence flag, I understand, Judge, I believe it is here because of the nature, the second degree nature of the charge. Uh, and he has no desire to have, as I understand, no desire to have any contact with the victim. And he is uh, well prepared to abide by the conditions laid out in the uh, temporary restraint. Uh, let me ask you this. Since the date yes, of, uh, it sounds like this wasn't reported. For, it allegedly occurred on the 28th of February. Uh, my yes, recollection sir. is this was a leap year. So it was the 29th of February. 29th. Yes, sir. Uh, and then uh, he, this wasn't reported as a criminal act till the, the, the 3rd, which was five days later, right? Uh, that would be right. Yes, sir. And so some point, in between, there was a restraining order procured by the complainant? It would appear so, yes, Judge. And what we but believe is someone suggested to her she signed a restraining order. But Let me ask yeah. you this. Between the time that the, either the restraining order was procured by the complainant or the criminal charges were uh, secured by, by the police, uh, do, has Mr. Rivers had any contact with the complainant? Not to my knowledge. Not at all. He doesn't even know where she is. He believes that she is in... Pennsylvania, but he does because DCP and P was well, involved in almost a month. It's almost a month. It's April first, and in that time, yeah. even though that there's there's, he's had not had any contact with her whatsoever. That's my understanding. Yes, Judge. Ms. Mazur, is that true? As far as you know, as far as I know, I'm waiting. Um, they they were supposed to contact the victim yesterday. I'm waiting for that update. Um, I mean, there's not been any contempt charges filed against them, right? No, no, not that I'm right. And as far as the aggravated assault from Pennsylvania that you have, I mean, I, there, I don't have very much information on that. Do you have any other information other than he was convicted? From the one from Texas? You mean the aggravated yeah. assault with a deadly weapon? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's all I have. I, I have his, um, there, I mean, there was other, I'm only talking about convictions. There was other charges associated with it, but it appears that he was convicted of that on the date that I that I gave um, in 2013, and it was aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. And last question, and I'll ask both counsel and whoever has information. Uh, you said there was a hospital visit? She did go to the hospital. Was she that saw on the 28th, or was that on the 3rd, or somewhere in between? No, that was on the 28th. 
So when the police responded to her house, she was taken to the hospital or she went on her own accord? It appears that actually the 29th. Okay. So um, yeah, after she... midnight or something? It's, it appears at nine, nine o'clock at night. Okay. So, in the, so um, we're in the morning. The, the nine in the morning? Yes. I'm sorry. So the next day she went to the hospital in the morning? Yes, Your Honor. And she continued at that time to, I guess, tell the police that, or tell the hospital the story that it was consensual. So it doesn't look like. So, so it, it appears, and I'm sorry, it's a little, it's a little confusing with all of the workers that was involved. It appears that she tells DCPMP, who was then involved, that he caused the injuries during a domestic violence incident, possibly from strangling her. Um, and then when the police arrive, she tells them, um, which is why the state's surmising that this was out of fear because once the police are involved, it appears she gets scared and she says that it was not him. Um, and then again, she tells um, uh, the judge for the TRO that it was him. Um, so, so that, that's kind of the timeline of how it, of it, how it happens. Your Honor, if I might interject. Yes. Judge, if when you look at the uh, page seven of seven of the preliminary law enforcement incident report it says the police responded and, the, and near the bottom, the victim indicated that she will seek treatment on her own. So I surmise from that judge, the police asked her if she wanted the treatment. She turned that down and said she would seek it on her own. Now, judge, you know, we, we've both been around. We understand how this works. She came up, she told the police that he wasn't involved in her injury. Then when she was interviewed by DCPMP, at some point, she says he was involved in the injury. Now, we understand that certain benefits might come to her if she's truly the victim of domestic violence, which could serve as a reason she gave a bit of a different story later, because then what she can get out of that is housing and that sort of thing. So that I would respectfully suggest to the court could be a reason that she um, reveals it differently other than her being scared in some way. So the bottom line is, Judge, he doesn't have any contact with her. She, DCPMP had a case on her, and they closed it when she moved out of state. So, uh, right, so he won't uh, have any contact with her. Ms. Mays, do you have any information that she moved out of state? I no? don't at this point. Let me, can I, may I have a moment just to check in, though? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I said I wasn't going to go back and forth, and then I went back and forth. <laughs> I don't know if Ms. Mazur is available. I have a bit of information on it. Do you want to wait till she comes back? Yeah, let's make sure she's paying attention. Ms. Mays or Mr. Thompson has some information he's going to. Thank you. And they should let me know within a couple, like hopefully 30 seconds. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Thompson. Well, it's my understanding, Judge, that she's in a 30 day rehab in the state of Pennsylvania to deal with her substance abuse issue. We have had contact with her aunt. So that's who I'm trying to. Okay. Yes, that's who I understand she was living with in Pennsylvania. I'm ready to rule. Do we want to move forward? Do you want 30 more seconds? No, that's that's fine. I don't think it'll change much. Okay, so. So usually. Uh, well, I don't want to say usually, but let me, let me start with this. Uh, it's a very, very serious charge. The second degree aggravated assault charge is a serious charge. It holds no early release act up to 10 years at 85%. That's probable cause has been found for that second degree charge. There's also a no release recommendation with an elevated risk of violence flag. Uh, and under those circumstances, I think that 
they would we, they would usually cause concern for the court. And I would say, if you under those circumstances, uh, the court has I guess had similar cases where uh, the court might find that the state has met its burden by clear convincing evidence uh, based upon the charge, based upon the, the potential sense, based upon the facts, and based upon a lot of the things that are going on here. When I review the what's been marked and moved into evidence is S1, uh, and I look at the factors here, the nature and circumstances of the offense charge, they're under New Jersey statutes 2C 12-1, the assault statute, certainly a strangulation can be an aggravated assault second degree if it causes risk of death uh, or substantial uh, or a serious bodily injury. Uh, I didn't hear any evidence in the case that it caused serious bodily injury. The reason I found probable cause was that there could be a risk of death, but there was nothing uh, argued from the hospital uh, or anything else that, that, that would say that the, the alleged victim in this case was placed in risk of death. And in fact, the aggravated assault statute was amended not too long ago to add a specific section which would be section subsection 13, 2, 2C 12-1B13, that made strangulation a crime of the third degree. In some, some circumstances, before that section was added, strangulation was being charged as a simple assault. So that was added specifically, so it could be charged as a third degree. Uh, and if you look all the way at the end, uh, at the gradation section of the aggravated assault statute, it's a third degree. Uh, I have to look at the nature and circumstances of the offense charged under the statute. I have to look at the weight of the evidence. And although probable cause was found, the weight of the evidence, there, there's not been nothing presented to the court uh, that this truly would, would be uh, at a higher level than probable cause, uh, a second degree aggravated assault. Uh, in addition, the statements of the alleged victim or the complainant here when she was when the police were called and she or the police responded i'm not even sure how they responded but they responded she advised them that this was a consensual act and then she appears to make different statements to uh, dcp and p uh possibly to family court uh and then there's some indication she, she left and she might be in a rehabilitation facility but that was part of the proffer of the defense so the weight of the evidence is not necessarily strong in this case. The history and characteristics of the defendant, the court is clearly concerned about the prior aggravated assault. But other than that, it sounds like he has stayed away from the complainant uh, during this entire month uh, when he had every opportunity to, I guess, intimidate her or contact her or do anything else that he wanted to do regarding her. It sounds like he works. It sounds like he has a local place to stay without her. Uh, at the time of the offense, I understand the argument that he's on pretrial release, but he's got a summons for a marijuana charge that this state is, is viewing differently these days. Uh, he's got no failures to appear, no, uh, at least not in New Jersey, not on the PSA. Uh, the nature and seriousness of the danger that the defendant would pose, it, sa it sounds like he may be a danger to the complainant. There's no question, but there's a restraining order in effect right now. He's abided by the restraining order. Uh, which we hear cases every day where defendants don't abide by the restraining order. He's abided by the restraining order in that he hasn't had contact with her, and he actually came back and he turned himself in. Uh, the court has viewed the, re the public safety assessment in this case and the no-release recommendation, which takes into consideration in your offense, which the court, while it's charged as a near offense, uh, made some comments about the fact that it may or may not be a second-degree offense, taking all that into consideration and there's a presumption of release here uh, under the statute, under the rule, there's a presumption of release. The state has the burden of proving everything by by proving one of the uh, the tried, as they call it, by clear and convincing evidence. They have to prove that there is the defendant, that his detention is necessary uh, and that there's no conditions, monetary or otherwise, that would assure his appearance in court, assure the protection and safety of a person or the community, and or assured that he will not obstruct justice. In this case, uh, there's no evidence he's going to not fit, not appear because he actually turned himself in. There's no evidence that he's going to obstruct justice because he didn't do anything like that in the month that he was out. And there's just no evidence to support that. The only basis that the state could actually move on here would be the danger 
to the victim, the alleged victim or the community. And it sounds like there's been no contact. She might, may or may not be in a rehab. They're not living together. He hasn't tried to get in touch with her. There's a restraining order, which he abided by. So under the circumstances, the motion for pretrial detention is denied. Uh, there are monetary or non-monetary conditions the court can impose that would assure defendant's appearance, assure the protection and safety of the community or uh, another person, and assure that the defendant will not obstruct justice. I'm going to impose those conditions now. Uh, Mr. Rivers, can you hear me? Can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to grant your release, but you under you got to abide by these conditions. All right. I understand you're charged with yes, something sir. very serious. If you don't abide by the conditions, the state's going to file an uh, immediate motion to, re to revoke your release, and it's probably going to be granted. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. Okay, so you're not going to you're going to appear for all scheduled court appearances. Uh, yes, Miss Riddle, do you know when the next court appearance will be in this case? Um, I believe Sean would know, Judge. It should be listed. Mr. Gallagher. May 21st, Judge. So you're going to be back May 21st at 845 a.m. before this court, correct? Is this Judge Gibson or? Yeah. Yes, sir. Mr. Gallagher, are you here before Judge Gibson? This is a Team B case. Judge, Judge Gibson. So, sir, you're going to be before Judge Gibson on May 21st, 2020 at 8.45 a.m. You understand that? Yes, sir. You're going to have to immediately notify pretrial services of the address that your lawyer gave that where you're going to be staying. As soon as you're released, you have to let them know that. You have to let them know your telephone number and all your contact information. You understand that? Yes, sir. You can't commit any new offense, including even a DP offense. You understand that? Yes, sir. You're going to have to avoid contact with the victim in this case. You understand you can't have any contact with the victim in this case. You understand that? Yes, sir. If you have contact with her, it'd be a violation, okay? Yes, sir. Can't go to her place of uh, residence, okay? You can't go to the victim's residence, you understand? Yes, sir. Don't go anywhere near that. You also have a restraining order, so you're gonna have to abide by that. You're gonna have to report to pretrial services you're going to be on level three, so it's going to be once every week in person, and then once the once in person, and then the next week by phone, in person by phone, alternating. All right. Yes, sir. That might be modified right now because of the coronavirus. You're going to have to get in touch with them and contact pretrial services. All right. Yes, sir. You can't possess a firearm, a destructive device, or dangerous weapon. You understand that? Yes, sir. You can't excessively use alcohol. You can't use drugs at all. You understand that? Yes, sir. I'm signing your release order now. You can be released today. Unless there's something else holding you, but I haven't heard that anything else is holding you. Yes, sir. Hey, as you know, Ms. Uh, Ms. Mazur, you certainly have the ability to take up the court's decision within that time frame, And you've already consulted with your client, Mr. Thompson, right? I have judge. Okay, is there anything further from you, Ms. Mazur? Your Honor, um, we would just ask for no third party contact with our victim either, because it is a little concerning that Mr. Thompson had information about where our victim was. Um, so if he's receiving that from the defendant or somebody through the defendant, um, well, that is which third party? Because, for example, let's say they have a mutual friend who's friends with both of them and she voluntarily contacts both. Uh, the victim and the defendant. I mean, how how would I preclude that? So who? Yeah, are, I understand that. We just have some concerns about how he's getting the information. So I guess I just wanted to reiterate that no, through through the defendant can't be contacting the victim, like getting contact to the victim through anybody else. Well, let me make it clear. And let me also write on here that if you violate the restraining order, that's obviously uh, you're gonna have to abide by the restraining order. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. So. Mr. Thompson, you'll advise your client. I'm going to advise Mr. Rivers. When I say no contact with the victim in this case, what I mean is you can't directly call, text, email, or show up and personally have contact with her. You also can't indirectly contact her through a friend. Like, for example, 
You can't say to Jean, her friend, I'm making Jean's name up, can't say to Jean, please contact the victim and tell her this. That's also a violation, all right? No social media contact. Right, well. right. So you can't have any. So if you are independently talking to people who have contact with her, that's fine. But you can't have them deliver a message to her or have them contact her on your behalf. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. Okay. Anything further, Ms. Mazur? No, Your Honor. Mr. Thompson? No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Good luck, sir. See you, uh, Judge Gibson, I'll see you back in court on May 21st, all right? Yes, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Good day.